Today, we're talking about the North Korean defector that's been heralded as a hero, but now appears to be getting exposed for lies. And America's dirty little secrets from the Baghdadi strike are starting to get exposed. There's a lot to talk about with those two, so buckle up, you beautiful bastards. Hit that like button and let's just jump into it. Starting with, we need to talk about Yanmi Park. Because for those of you who do not know, she's a YouTuber and author who has risen to prominence as a human rights celebrity by sharing her story as a North Korean defector, with the Washington Post even describing her as one of the most famous North Korea defectors in the world. And she is a very big deal, right? She has more than a million subscribers on YouTube. Her 2015 memoir, In Order to Live, has sold over 100,000 copies. And her new book, Wild Time Remains, published this last February, has already made tens of thousands of sales. But also, more recently, Park has taken on this new role of conservative commentator. Because right? in the past few years, Park has taken aim at the U.S. comparing American liberalism and woke culture to the dictatorship in North Korea and claiming that America is on the path to tyranny. With her largely drawing from her time as an undergrad at Columbia and branding herself as the enemy of the woke. And so, of course, with branding like that, right-wing personalities have absolutely eaten that up. With Park becoming a multi-platform right-wing media star and appearing on some of the most popular right-leaning podcasts. But also, Park's rise on the right comes as she's been hounded for years with accusations from journalists, experts, and even other North Korean defectors that many of her stories just don't add up, with some of her tales ranging from just being inconsistent to just explicitly contradictory. And while those allegations have been floating around for years, there's been renewed scrutiny as she's become so popular. And just this month, the Washington Post published an explosive investigation that also found many inconsistencies with her claims. Right, with that article starting at the beginning of Park's rise to fame as a teenage panelist on the hit South Korean show, now on my way to meet you. A docuseries about reunifying families that have been separated during the Korean War. And that being where Park first began sharing her history, saying she was born in a city that bordered China in 1993. Saying that her father was a member of the ruling Workers' Party of Korea who was sentenced to prison for smuggling medals on the black market to support their family. With her eventually able to escape in 2007 when she was 13 years old, fleeing first to China and then making her way to South Korea. So definitely an intense and harrowing story, and there's no doubt about that. But it's the claims that she makes about just how bad North Korea is and how awful her life was there that have raised eyebrows. Because as the Post explains, while most of Park's Now On My Way To Meet You co-stars recounted stories of deprivation, she was dubbed Paris Hilton because of the tale she told of her family's relative wealth in North Korea, a lifestyle accessorized with imported Japanese fashion and Chanel bags. And then, in 2014, she gained much broader international attention for a speech she gave at the One Young World Summit in Ireland that went viral and attracted over 80 million views. And that is when everything began to change with the Post writing. Experts on North Korea took note of the strikingly different bio that emerged when Park moved from reality TV to the International Human Rights Conference circuit. Right? Her Paris Hilton character was nowhere in that story. But it's also echoed by a Korean studies professor who told The Post she once presented herself as the top 1% North Korea elite, so she didn't see any hunger or malnutrition when she was living there. But then saying she totally flipped the narrative when she was on to these conferences. And at the same time, he had another expert who spoke to The Post noting the Park's shift in the narrative didn't even match the stories of her own family, with her mother describing access to not only food, but other luxuries during an appearance on Now On My Way To Meet You. With Park's mother even saying that her daughter, Yanmi, couldn't even wrap her head around the fact that some of the less privileged people on the show even came from the same country she did. Now Park, for her part, addressed this shift in her memoir by saying that she just didn't want to talk about hardships she went through during her childhood on South Korean TV because she no longer even thought about it. She also has previously claimed that some discrepancies in her early interviews in America can be chalked up to the fact that she wasn't fluent in English. But a lot of people say, even with that, there are a lot of things that just don't add up. With the Post again, for example, pointing to a 2014 article published by The Diplomat by Mary Ann Jolly, a journalist who had interviewed Park for a documentary and who pointed out numerous discrepancies with her claims. Right, according to Jolly, while Park told The Diplomat that both her her and her sister were left to protect themselves at 9 and 11 years old when their parents were jailed, saying we couldn't go to school. We just go down to the riverside and we can shower and wash our clothes there, and then we go to the mountains and get the grass to eat, adding that she ate wild foods like grass or sometimes dragonflies, just anything I could eat at that time. But on a previous interview with BBC Radio, she had said that when her parents were imprisoned, her sister lived at her uncle's house while Park herself was sent to live at her aunt's house in the countryside for three years. And when asked about the hardship she experienced during another interview around the same time, she made zero mention of grass and dragonflies, instead saying she could afford two meals. But also comparing that to people who lived on the streets and quote, eat everything and even going as far as to assert that her hardships were nothing comparatively. And that also seemingly backed up by her mom during her On My Way to Meet You appearance. And another key thing there, the host of the show even noting that when people talked about struggling to eat or eating grass, Park would say, oh, that never happened and asked her mother why that was. To which she responded, we were not to that extent. We were just never in a position where we were starving. Park has also made numerous claims about executions in North Korea that have been questioned and even directly refuted. As she previously said, she saw her friend's mother execute executed in a stadium for watching a Hollywood movie. Sometimes when she told the story, she said it was a South Korean DVD, not a Hollywood movie. But also beyond that discrepancy, other defectors even told the diplomat that not only were there never executions in the stadium that she was talking about, there weren't even any executions happening in the city that she lived in during that time period she described. With one woman who defected from the same city as Park a few years after telling the diplomat, how can you be executed for watching an American film? It sounds ridiculous even saying it. That has never happened before. Other defectors also confirming that, as did Andre Lankov, who is one of the leading authorities on North Korea, 
Korea, having studied there in the 80s, taken multiple research trips and interviewed hundreds of defectors. And while both he and the other defectors said that people could go to jail for watching Western movies, they wouldn't be executed. Blenkov telling the outlet that the kinds of crimes that usually result in public executions are murder, large-scale theft, especially of the government property, sometimes involvement with large-scale smuggling operations, including human trafficking. And that's also not Park's only account of executions that Lankov has disputed. Right, as recently as 2021, she went on Joe Rogan's podcast where she made more claims about public executions. And what are the crimes that you could be sentenced to death for? It's as, li as little as, so in North Korea, every room has to have a portrait of Kim's. And the inspector comes out of nowhere in the middle of night and then touch the portraits if they see any dust. They say your royalty is not high enough. And then you can get executed and sent to prison camp through the generation of your family. But Lenkov told The Post that this is a distortion of something that happens in North Korea where citizens are forced to have self-criticism sessions where they confess failings. And sometimes, due to pressure, they resort to sharing minor offenses that will let them off with minor punishments like not properly maintaining their shrine to the Kims. But he said Park is seriously exaggerating and her description would be the equivalent of telling North Koreans that Americans can be executed for a speeding ticket. And there are also other smaller claims too, like Park's repeated claims that North Koreans don't have maps of the world and that they don't have to learn simple math like one plus one equals two. Lenkov noting that pictures of elementary school textbooks prove that's just not true. And Park's seemingly false stories have now gone beyond just North Korea and veered into hot button issues in America. For example, during her interview with Rogan, Park claimed that she got punched and robbed by three black women during the George Floyd protests in 2020 when she was in Chicago. I was trying to catch and call the police and these people on the street, the bystanders, of white people, calling me I'm a racist, telling me that the color of skin doesn't make them a thief. And I became- Wait a minute, wait a minute. So you got robbed by these three black women. And I got punched. You got punched and it's robbed. It's violence, yeah. And so you called the police and who- I tried to call them and they took, prevent me not calling the police. Who was trying to tell you not to call the police? It's all the people on the street. That on the watched Michigan it? Avenue, yeah. People that saw the crime? Yeah. What they're going on to say, the police later got footage of the three black women because they used her credit card and adding. Of course, they, they are not going to prosecute this girl, right? There's so much crime in Chicago. They are not going to prosecute yeah. somebody who robs. And that's when I was thinking, this country lost it. But according to a Chicago police statement obtained by the Daily Mail, Park wasn't robbed by three women, but rather a woman and a man, which is arguably a weird thing to change. And also the female suspect was prosecuted, being charged with a crime, pleading guilty and serving two years in prison, with even Park herself acknowledging that the female robber was prosecuted in her most recent book. And I understand everything that we're talking about, it's, I don't even want to call it a greatest hits or a highlight reel. These are just some of the things in a much bigger situation. And so if you want to dive deeper, I'll link to articles down below. But you have this all around bizarre situation and you have people going, well, why, why do this. But well, there, the answer would be like it is for most stories, clout and or money. Right? There's a lot of direct and indirect money to be made with engagements and ongoing work with right-wing groups. Right? Obviously, as her star rises and she goes on these shows and they're clipped and more people find out about her, more people are more inclined to, you know, buy her book and things like that. But also you get examples like direct payments, where they're telling reporters she made $6,600 a month working with conservative group Turning Points USA, and that was just one engagement. There's also a thing that I want to mention. I do not want anything in this to seem like I am pro-North Korea. Fuck the Kims, those murders murderous monsters. But my feelings need to be based in reality. And that's also what you have experts saying that spreading false or exaggerated claims about North Korea not only undermines the real stories of other defectors, but it also hurts the actual people who live there under the regime because it overshadows actual concerns about human rights in the country. With another expert saying she basically just acts as a mirror for conservative audiences to look into and having all their fears about liberals turning America into an authoritarian hellhole reflected right back at them. And those are actually all points that have been repeatedly made by people like Hassan Piker, a political commentator, who also notably talked about Park a number of times over the last few years, with him continually calling her a grifter, saying that while there is a market in America for North Korean defectors who want to share their real traumatic experiences in an oppressive country, Park takes it to a whole other level. There are plenty of, um, plenty of very real harrowing realities from North Korea, obviously, so there's truth to it as well, but you get bored after a while of hearing the same shit. So what she does instead that I think is like pretty smart is she'll turn around and basically say like, in America is just like North Korea because of liberals. It literally minimizes the experiences that people living under the brutal regime, the brutal uh, Kim Jong-un regime, this person is literally a grifter. There are a lot of defectors that do this. Uh, you know, props to them, they escaped. And uh, now they wanna make money. And there is a massive audience of idiots that are like, hell yeah, brother, in North Korea, they, uh, you're right, brother, they're just fucking, you know, it's the worst place. They all want to kill us. They all want to murder us, brother. Yeah, fuck yeah, like, we should glass North Korea. And uh, this is all that this is, is to just like give people that 
fuel to feel that way. But with all that's been said and shared, I now got to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And then switching gears, you know, last week I was telling y'all how HelloFresh quick and easy meals have been a lifesaver countless times for me. But with that, I forgot to tell you how great these quick and easy meals taste. So thank you HelloFresh, not only for sponsoring today's show, but I guess also for existing. You know, weekends can get hectic, but you gotta eat. And not only was the mozzarella crusted chicken with blistered tomatoes and potato wedges a hit with all of us, it didn't steal time from our Saturday. Because HelloFresh wants you to have it all, free time and fresh tasty food. They take care of the meal planning and deliver the ingredients. So everything you need to whip up a delicious meal arrives right to your door. And HelloFresh's menu features calorie smart and protein smart options, plus new vegan dinners to choose from. You having people over? They've got crowd pleasing treats from a backyard bratwurst bar to tangy key lime pie. HelloFresh Market makes summer entertaining a cinch. And it's also not just meals. They offer snacks and sides too. And did I mention HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and most takeouts? So y'all go to HelloFresh.com slash DeFranco50 and use code DeFranco50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's right, I'm serious. HelloFresh.com slash DeFranco50 and code DeFranco50 gets you 50% off plus free shipping. It is honestly a no-brainer. So go try America's number one meal kit today. And then, now nearly four years after everything went down, we're still learning more dirty details about the U.S. raid on the Syrian compound of ISIS founder Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Right, you might remember in the announcement of Baghdadi's death, Trump and his military presented the operation as this flawless, outstanding victory. He died after running into a dead-end tunnel, whimpering and crying and screaming all the way. He died like a dog. But subsequent reporting and Pentagon documents obtained by NPR show that the operation probably wasn't as clean as he'd like to admit. Or while the president watched the raid unfold from thousands of miles away, a Syrian man by the name of Barakat Ahmad Barakat was enjoying what he thought was a normal night. With him telling NPR, he and two of his friends were working as agricultural laborers at an olive press. They were driving him home. A claim that's also been backed up by a nonprofit that has receipts showing Barakat was transporting olives to an olive press in the days leading up to this one. As well as seven relatives of the friends who said the two men operated a van service and had no connection to any armed group. And so they happened to take the shortest route to Barakat's village, which leads them through a neighboring village on the way. With him saying, we had pumpkin seeds and brought coffee on the road and were having fun. But they had no idea Baghdadi was hiding in a compound up the road, nor that the U.S. Special Forces were in the middle of a raid on that compound. So when a missile suddenly strikes their van, they're startled. With Barakat saying, there was nothing suspicious at all. There was nothing ahead of us on the road. Suddenly I felt something hit us. I didn't know what was going on. I was just trying to escape death. And so they rush out of the van. They begin to flee, but one of the friends falls with his leg filled with shrapnel. Barakat then takes the other wounded friends in his arms. He has his emotional final moment with him recalling, he told me, I am dying. I told him, no, just say God's name. And I held him in my lap. And then as he's cradling this man, another airstrike lands, killing both friends. So Barakat Barakat runs for cover and he survives, but his right and left hand have been badly injured. With him later getting surgery to remove shrapnel from his left arm and partially amputate his right. But according to one advocacy group, he can no longer afford physical therapy sessions and his injuries prevent him from working to feed his five young children. And I'm saying, we're farmers. I make less than a dollar a day. Now I'm handicapped and my two friends are in their graves. Now, after that raid, the U.S. military took responsibility for the attack, but claimed that the men were militants unaffiliated with ISIS in a van that displayed hostile intent. And in 2020, the Pentagon cleared its troops of any wrongdoing and deemed the victims' families ineligible for compensation, saying in its internal report that the American troops exchanged fire with combatants at an intersection and then noticed the van approaching the same spot, then claiming they fired warning shots, but the van just kept coming, so they neutralized it. But then, NPR sued the Defense Department for a copy of that report, and once they obtained it, they found the story was a lot more complicated. When U.S. ground troops first spotted the van headed towards them, it was some 1,100 feet away. But then they let it traverse about half that distance without doing anything to ward it off. Then a U.S. aircraft, most likely an attack helicopter, fired warning shots on the road about 50 or 60 feet in front of the vehicle. Which means even if the van had been moving just 15 miles an hour, it would have only given them two or three seconds to react before getting hit by the gunfire. Which then is even harder when you remember that all of this happened around midnight and the driver probably didn't know where the gunfire was coming from. And with this, a military official claimed at the time that initial reports were that the van had fired on U.S. helicopters. But in a declassified email the next year, an official said that actually no gunfire had come from the van. Also, according to the report, an aircraft pilot thought they saw more explosions come from the van after the strike, indicating that it contained weapons or explosives. But then the Pentagon found that in retrospect, it couldn't determine what the explosion was. And Barakat claims that they had no weapons. Plus, there was no indication that any investigators went down to the site. And this, even though there appeared to have been some doubt within the DOD itself as to whether the victims were actually militants. With an analyst in the report recommending that officials compile an intel dossier that, quote, further addresses the characterization of the individuals killed and injured as unlawful enemy belief. But as of March, a military told NPR there was no record of such a document ever being produced. And despite all this reporting from NPR, the Pentagon dismissed the allegations and questioned the veracity of its sources. But also, it apparently never contacted Barakat or any of the dead men's relatives itself. And so as of right now, it looks like those affected by this tragedy still likely won't get a smidgen of justice. And their suffering's just been overshadowed by the celebration of Baghdadi's downfall. And unfortunately for the U.S. military, this is kind of just par for the course. Right, if you take the time to look, you see this story happen over and over again. Right, famously, during the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, a drone launch with 
the Pentagon called a righteous strike on a vehicle believed to be carrying an ISIS bomb toward the airport. But as it later admitted after media reports cast doubt on that, the car actually just held 10 civilians, including seven children, all of whom died. And just like with the situation with the Baghdadi raid, no one was held accountable. You also have an especially horrific example from March of 2019 when a U.S. fighter jet dropped a 500-pound bomb on a large crowd of women and children huddled against a riverbank, with a jet swooping back in to drop two more 2,000-pound bombs on the survivors, killing some 80 people in total. Though the Pentagon only acknowledged four civilian casualties, claiming 16 were fighters and the rest were unknown partly because women and children in the Islamic State sometimes took up arms. And as soon as that happened, people within the DOD immediately knew something had gone wrong, but the Pentagon never publicly acknowledged it until the Times broke the story. With the outlet reporting that after a legal officer flagged this as a possible war crime, the military sought to cover up what happened at every step of the way. Downplaying the death toll, delaying, sanitizing, and classifying reports, bulldozing the blast site, and failing to notify top leaders. And unfortunately, while the high death toll there was exceptional, the deadly bombing of civilians wasn't. Right? Because you have the Times and other outlets extensively documenting how the military has repeatedly killed unarmed people believing that they were militants, yet never learning from its mistakes. And showing how confirmation bias often leads commanders to misinterpret data. Right? Like when people are seen rushing toward a fresh bombing site, the Pentagon assumes they're ISIS fighters, not civilian rescuers. Or at times where multiple men appear to be moving in formation, which signals an imminent attack, or actually just guys on motorcycles. Or is when it's seen as no civilian presence being detected, when in fact commanders don't understand that families are sleeping through the daytime Ramadan fast, or sheltering inside to avoid the heat or fighting outside. And the unfortunate thing is it's impossible to know exactly how many civilians have been killed this way, because the Pentagon often undercounts them, even in classified reports. And as far as the deaths they do acknowledge, they usually just blame them on fog of war, or they spin them as regrettable, yet unavoidable mistakes. And ultimately, when we talk about stories like this, people kind of land in one of two camps. Either you have people demanding that the Pentagon tighten its rules and procedures to make fighting more clean, or they argue that wars are inherently dirty, so we just kind of need to accept that cost. So obviously, it's easier to accept that cost when it's not your family that's been blown up. And that is where this Sunday dive into the news is going to end, but do not worry, because for more news you need to know, I got you covered right here. You can click or tap or in those links down below. And because as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow.